the theme, go, compel, and fill. Say that with me. Go, compel, and fill. Again, in Luke 14, we have the story of a man throwing a big dinner. He had invited friends and people, and as the time came around, they one after another began to make excuses. And so it kind of angered him how everybody was seemingly refusing his invitation. So he said to his servant, go and find the maimed, the poor, the blind, the helpless, and have them come. The servant comes back later. He says, I've done that, and yet there's still room. And so Luke 14, 23 says this. He, the, the master again said to him, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house might be filled. Now, most Bible scholars believe with all of their hearts that Jesus is talking about his house. I believe that as well. You and I are the ones, though, who give the invitation. 
Once someone comes, it's the Holy Spirit who takes over. Once you bring them here, you're finished. That's all you've got to do is invite them to the house, get them to come, compel them to come. But once you bring them in the house, you've done your part. Now it's up to Holy Spirit to draw them by his power. Can you say amen? And so you can come sit down with them in the seat and all of a sudden you can just breathe a sigh of relief. I have them here. Now go God. Amen. I want you to say that. Go God. Because God wants to touch our friends. But today, something just as important that I want to add to what we're talking about is what should we expect at the master's dinner when we come to church? What should we expect when we bring our friends? Today, there's so much of the idea that we've got to water everything down If we bring them, we want to be so careful we don't offend them that we've actually offended the Lord of the harvest. Amen. It's really true. We've done so much to be so friendly to everybody else that we've actually hurt the saints in the house because the saints in the house need to also be fed the Word of God. Can you say amen? Now, what should we expect? Notice what 1 Corinthians 14, 26 said. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you, I want you to point to yourself and say, I have a part. Each of you has a psalm. For instance, let's stop there for a moment. Israel's songbook was the Psalms. You and I come together in the house of the Lord. We begin to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and hymns and hymns and hymns and hymns. Hallelujah. We need some hymns. Anybody agree we need some hymns? We want all the music that's available, but we need some psalms, some hymns, and some spiritual songs because there's something about some of those hymns that were written in the depth of people's hearts that when you begin to sing them, it it may not be up-to-date music, but it's up-to-date words from the Holy Spirit because His words never go down. So we need psalms. Say psalms. And hymns and spiritual songs. Hallelujah. The Bible says singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when we come to the house of the Lord, we should be singing songs that bring down the presence of the living God. I told our musicians a while back, I said, I want you to look for songs. I do want the new. I want, to, I, I want modernity in this house. But at the same time, I want you to look for songs that usher in the presence of the Lord because it's his presence that changes life from glory to glory. We're being changed even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How many of you believe that? Shout out loud, I believe that. So when you come together, you have psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You have a teaching, and it says, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. I like the fact that sandwiched between has a tongue and an interpretation is a revelation. Many times the Spirit of God comes and He begins to work in our midst and we need a revelation of what to do about it now. There needs to be a revelation in that service. I remember years ago I went down to actually where uh, uh, Eric, Eric's grandfather was pastor. He and his brother Rick, and uh, not, not Eric's brother, but Pastor Woody's son, Rick. And uh, I was down there and while I was praying in a room in the afternoon, I saw in the spirit this lady that had a, um, one of those things around your neck, you know, you've seen them where it holds your neck steady while you're being healed. And so anyhow, I just saw this in the room. I saw right where the lady was seated, sitting. It was a revelation to me. I saw her right exactly where she'd be in the service. And I got out there that night. And the minute I went to the podium, I began to look for that woman. And there she was just a little bit to my right, dead center, but to my right a little bit. And so I called her down and I ministered to her. She'd been in an accident. She had a a, uh, situation that could not be fixed without the help of the Lord. And it was interesting that it ended up being Pastor Rick's mother-in-law. I didn't know it. I didn't know anything about it. But God instantly healed her that morning. I thank God for revelation. I thank God for the word of knowledge. I thank God for the word of wisdom. I thank God for discerning of spirits. I thank God for the operation of the Holy Spirit. He says when we come together, not only do we have a tongue, 
not only do we have an interpretation, but we also should have a revelation. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. We should come expecting God to manifest himself. Suppose you brought your neighbor. Suppose you brought your friend. Then all of a sudden in the middle of the service, the Spirit of God gives a revelation. And they know by the, they know by the circumstances in their life, that's God talking to me. The, we're trying to take prophecy out of the church. The Bible says when you allow prophecy to go forth in the name of the Lord, and it needs to be inspired of the Spirit. It doesn't need to be out of season in the service. It needs to fit the service. But when the Spirit of God comes and gives a word, he said the hearts of those who do not believe will be opened up. When you speak in a tongue, he said it is a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. You and I need to stand for the supernatural power of God. We need to stand for the operation of the Holy Spirit in our midst because it is not by our might. It's not by our power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. We will never accomplish in the flesh what can only be done in the spirit. We may bring somebody in the room, but we can't go inside of them. The Holy Spirit can reveal himself and go inside of them and show them things. There's people all over this room. You could say to me, Pastor Reggie, while the word was being preached, while a word from the spirit was being given, it touched my heart. It talked right where I am. How many of you in this room have had that experience? Let me see your hand. All over this room. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes and he is the revealer of truth and he is the operation of God. Hallelujah. He comes and does wonderful things. So when we come together, expect things to happen and let's not water down what God is all about. Dr. Rutland made a statement one time I thought was a powerful, powerful statement. He says every degree we go away from Pentecost is a degree away from God's original intent for the church. God called his church to be a Pentecostal church. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting there appearing unto them cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in a heavenly language. Praise God, the first church service that we know of was full of the supernatural. Why would we start out in the supernatural and now end up in the natural? Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now, we need to contend for the Spirit. We need to walk for the Spirit. We need to embrace the Spirit. We need to welcome Him in our midst. Hallelujah. I'm all for doing everything as fun and nice as we can. But I want to tell you something at the end of the day, what people need is not more lights. It's not dancing. It's not all the other things. It is the presence of the living God. That's what will change a life. You can get all the other stuff outside of the church, but that is only for the church. Hallelujah. You're talking about franchises. All over the world, I look for those big arches. I know that when I see the big arches, there's a Diet Coke in there somewhere waiting for me. When you come to the house of the Lord, when you see the cross, it should represent something different than the world. When we come in the house, it should be different. I talked a few minutes last time about Acts chapter 10. I talked about how Cornelius was a man seeking God with all that he had, but he didn't know all the truth. And an angel appeared to him and said, send for Peter. Told him exactly where he is. He's down by the seaside in Simon the Tanner's house. While, while he said, I want you to send for him. Send some men and bring him to your house because he has words to tell you. On the other end is Peter. He's up on the housetop praying. While he's praying, hallelujah, a sheet was let down from heaven. On it, all kinds of four-footed beasts and birds of the air and fowls of the air. And he says to him, kill and eat. And Peter speaks up and says, not so. I've never eaten anything common or unclean in my life. Again, the sheet comes down and he's having a real struggle with it. And God says, what I've cleansed, don't you call common. Don't call your neighbor common. Don't call a person of color common. You just take everybody exactly the way the Lord made them and you love them with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and your strength. And you speak life to them and you tell them, you might hear them fighting in their house. You might hear things going on or see things they're going through with their kid. It's a good thing to go over and say, my neighbor, I wanna tell you something. There's a better life for you. There's a better way for you. I want to invite you to come to my church because at my church, you can find life and find it more abundantly. You may 
may not feel the boldness to win them right there, but I'll tell you if you'll bring them in the house, if you'll get them in the atmosphere. It said while, while all of this was going on, Cornelius calls all of his friends. He calls all of his family in. Then all of a sudden, Peter shows up. He says, I want you to go, not asking any questions. There's somebody coming to the door to take you down to Cornelius' house. And Peter went with them. And it says, when Peter got there, while he was still preaching, I want you to tell somebody, while he was preaching, said the Holy Spirit fell upon them just like he did us in the very beginning. He's referring back to the day of Pentecost. I want you to know it was not only open to the Jewish people, it was open to the Gentiles. All who will come, everyone who's thirsty come and drink of the life that comes from the fountain of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? While I was at Sean's, I had such a wonderful time, and I was preaching for Sean last Sunday morning. Actually, the Wednesday before that, I was up in D.C. at Summit Church, Pastor Eddie's church. I had a great time with him. Uh, so I came home for a day. Then I left and went to Denver Saturday, spoke for Sean on Sunday. While I'm preaching and got to this point at Pastor Eddie's, I had stopped there. But at Sean's, for some reason... I felt to go further. I had such freedom in the Holy Spirit. I felt that the Lord wanted me to just take it a little further because Sean is pastoring a church where a good amount of his people are denominational people. They've never come into the things of the Spirit. And I, but I had such freedom to speak. So I opened up and I began to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I began to talk about the power of God, what it'll do in your life, the change that it'll make. Coming to Jesus is one thing. That gets you ready for heaven. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it gets you ready for earth. Hallelujah. And I talked about that. And then just quietly, right where they were seated, without any demonstration in the natural, I just said, right where you are, if you would like to receive this power, if you would like to have your language, your prayer language in the Spirit, I want you right now, as I begin to say receive, I want you just to receive it. Well, I did that. It's all quiet. Everything was quiet. But when I got ready to leave, a young man in his late 20s and early 30s, he comes over to me. He said, Pastor Reggie, I got power today. Hallelujah. I got power today. Another lady comes up to me. She says, I had a struggle when you said that uh, tongues are the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit. She said, I was brought up not believing that that was real, that it was of the devil, and I'm having such a time with this. So how can you answer that? Do you honestly believe you cannot be filled with the Spirit without speaking in tongues? I said, listen, you may can be filled with the Spirit without speaking in tongues, but the problem is I won't know that you've been filled. It is the initial evidence. It is the initial evidence. I know that you're filled before you speak. Do you understand? We are, and some people will come right, right to the door and they won't go any further. But the thing about releasing yourself with the prayer language is it opens a whole world to you to where you can build yourself up on your most holy faith. You can pray things out that look impossible. I tell you, I've been in possible situations where in the middle of the night I couldn't sleep because I'm thinking about all the pressures that I had on me and I would get up and I'd begin to walk and I would begin to talk. I would begin to walk and I would begin to talk and it wouldn't be long until the prayer language of the Holy Spirit would flow out of me and although nothing had changed, by the time I went to bed everything changed and I was able to go sleep like a baby. Hallelujah! Thank God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the operation of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? And a lot of people think you've got to lay hands on people to be filled. It is one way to be filled. But right there, in, when Cornelius was preaching, or, or Peter was preaching at Cornelius' house, the Spirit fell on them, and they were filled and spoke with tongues without any laying on of hands. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing what happens on the day of Pentecost. Nobody was laying hands. They just received, waiting on the Lord. All of a sudden, the Spirit of God came, and all of them were filled and began to speak with other tongues. But if you go to Acts, the 19th chapter, Apollos was there in Ephesus, and Paul comes along, and Paul says to them, he says, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Listen to this. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since? You believe. They'd already believed. Paul is asking them, were you baptized in the Holy Spirit after you believed? 
And they said back to Paul, we haven't heard whether there even is a Holy Ghost. And he said, under what then were you baptized? They said, under John's baptism. He began to explain to them the baptism in water through the name of Jesus. And it says they did that. And after they had done that, Paul laid his hands on them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And he said, now can anyone forbid water that these could be baptized in the name of Jesus? All of the elements of the Spirit-filled life are found right in that 19th chapter. I want to tell you, friends, this thing is real. It's really real. I want you to say it with me. It's real. It's real. It's real. It's real. I know it's real. Know. It's Pentecostal blessing. And I know, I know it's real. Why am I telling you this? Because when you bring your friends, don't hope it's not one of those days. When you bring your friends, don't hope it's just something going to be a little goofy and going to embarrass you. Listen, they're, they're not going to church already. They're not coming to the house of the Lord already. There'll be something in the house of the Lord that the Lord will use to prick their hearts. It is a convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Don't you ever underestimate the power of God. When he comes, he changes. When he comes, comes, he heals. When he comes, he delivers. When he comes, he encourages. He is the mighty Holy Spirit, and he comes to church. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's among us today, drawing us to Jesus, through Jesus, to the Father. No way to come to the Father but through the Son. The Holy Spirit come. He convicts your heart of sin. You come to the Father through Jesus, and all of a sudden, your life changes. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. Behold, all things have become brand new. Old things have passed away. Everything you did in your past is forgiven. It's thrown in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you again. Don't you ever go back there. Don't you go fishing in that pond any longer. It's buried in the sea of forgetfulness, and you accept who you are. If the devil comes and tries to remind you of your past, you remind him of your future. I am a new creation. I am in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. And I am brand new in Christ. I am a brand new creation. My outside doesn't look much better. I wish that changed when you got saved, but it doesn't. The outside, if you're ugly, you're still ugly. If you're pretty, you're still pretty. If you're somewhere in the middle, you're somewhere in the middle. The outside doesn't change, but the inward man is renewed every day. Why should old people stay young? Because they have an inward man and they're renewed every day. When I'm 85, 87, 90, I'm telling you, I'm going to keep right on saying just what I say right now. There's a new life in you. Jesus has come to give you life and to give you abundant life. You do not, your physical body may be aging, your outward man is decaying, yet your inward man is being renewed every day. Don't get old like the world. Stay new like the Spirit. Hallelujah. He's new every day. Every morning, His faithfulness works on our behalf. So that's why I reject bringing the world into the church. Some people don't understand it. I take a stand that if there's going to be music in this house, it's going to be music that brings us to Jesus. If we have film clips in this house, it's going to be film clips that are about Jesus. Now, I want to say this right up front. I'm not down on good, clean, secular music. Some people get upset if you even say that, but I mean that. I go down the road all the time, listen to classical music, love it. If you hear me on my, on my motorcycle, I sound like the, the pinky dinky ice cream man. <laughs> I, I, I'm going along and you can hear music, you can hear, set, you know, you can hear classical music playing or I've got Fox News on or something, you know. I'm not sitting over there in a corner somewhere, not aware of the world around me. But when it comes to the house, hallelujah, 1 Timothy 3, 15, the apostle Paul is telling his son in the face some things, and he said, I'm saying these things so that you will know how to behave yourself in the house of the Lord, which is the pillar and the ground of the truth. If we mix it up, if we mix the world in it, we're going to cause it to be watered down, and the next thing you know, there will not be any power. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For herein is the righteousness of God revealed. As it is written, the just shall live by their faith. When you and I find Jesus, we're to live by our faith. We're to go out into the world and tell people about Jesus. We're to go out there and invite them into the house. And when they come in the house, you've done your job. Other than you've prayed about them before you bring them, you've trusted the Holy Spirit to bring to touch them when they come. But when you bring them in the house, it's the Holy Spirit who will tap them and call them. You wonder Sunday after Sunday why so many people respond. It's not us. We can't do it. When I, when I go to give an altar call, I just step back. I know I can't do it. There's somebody much bigger than me that draws them. And he'll begin to draw. When the preacher has preached, it's up to the Holy Spirit to fall. It's up to the Holy Spirit to convict. It's up to the Holy Spirit to draw. So I want to say to you, friends, get busy. Because someday, somebody's going to meet you in heaven. And they're going to say, you remember when I was trying to get you to invite me to church? And you were embarrassed about church. You overcame your embarrassment. You overcame your reluctance. You overcame all that. And you finally invited me to church. And when I came, I responded to Jesus Christ. And my life has never been the same. I was 17 years of age. I'd run away from home. I'd been a mess. I came home and Jim and Tammy Baker were having a revival in my church. That's before all the problems that went on later. They were really a young couple sold out to Jesus, dedicated to Jesus. And I remember being in the service that night. I liked it because they're singing music and there's just a nice atmosphere. And I kind of identified with it and enjoyed it. And when the altar call came, I'm getting ready to get out of my seat. I didn't know if I was going down front or out back, out the door. I wasn't sure. I just knew I was going somewhere. I was convicted by the Spirit of God. The the Spirit of God had taken hold of me and was pricking my heart and convicting me and calling me. And I turned to go out of the aisle, and there was a lady in our church standing right there. She says, come go with me. And she led me down to the altar. See, God used her. I still don't know whether I'd gone down front or gone out back. But I know this. Although I was a mess for a while after that. How many of you know people don't clean up overnight? How many of you know you don't catch fish all cleaned up? How many of you know that? They don't come clean. I was still a mess. But something had happened on the inside of me that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was a child of God. And I started my process of sanctification. And I thank God for that. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in a life. He can get through to your son that's gone astray. He can get through to your precious granddaughter who's gone astray. He is the mighty Holy Spirit. He can go where no man can go. He can do what no man can do. So that's the second part. What we need to expect is while the word is being preached that the Holy Spirit does his job. He does his job. He convicts of sin, and he causes people to come. Did you notice the word convict does not mean condemn? The Holy Spirit does not condemn. He convicts. We should never go around condemning people. We should share with them so that the Holy Spirit has substance to convict with, but never condemning. They already know they're sinners. They already know they're sinning. They already know they're doing wrong. You need to start talking to them about the love of God, about the goodness of God. I don't mean, I don't mean endorsing what they're doing. That's not the point. But you need to tell them there's a life better. There's a new life that you're going to have in Jesus Christ. And begin. But don't go condemning people. They'll walk out and never come back. I used to have a situation here at the church. People would come and get saved. And the next thing you know, this one particular person was always saying something a little hurtful to the point we just couldn't afford that anymore in the house. I want to tell you something. When somebody comes to Jesus, encourage them. When somebody comes to the house of the Lord, I don't care what they look like. You're looking at the outward man. God looks at the heart. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad he looks at the heart? I see some people don't look too hot on the outside, but God sees past the outside to the heart, and he calls them just like they are. Amen.